Supreme Court, the Term and Review, a Federal Judicial Center program for judges, staff attorneys, and law clerks. Now from our studio in Washington, D.C., here's John Cook. Hello, I'm John Cook, Deputy Director at the Federal Judicial Center. Welcome to this year's edition of Supreme Court, the Term and Review, our annual look at the court's decisions most likely to affect the day-to-day -day work of federal judges. Sadly, the most significant event at the court this term was not an argument or decision, but the death in February of Associate Justice Antonin Scalia. Justice Scalia's tenure on the court spanned nearly three decades, during which he left a lasting mark on the court's jurisprudence. His passing was and will be felt in many ways. Most immediately, it left the court with only eight justices for the remainder of the term. That led to four cases in which no majority could be formed and the lower court decision was affirmed by an equally divided court. This vacancy's effect on other decisions and deliberations can only be guessed at. In any event, the court did resolve questions involving equal protection, search and seizure, criminal law, and abortion rights. We'll discuss these and many others with our faculty today. We're fortunate again to be joined by Erwin Shemarinsky, Dean of the University of California at Irvine School of Law, Evan Lee of the Hastings College of Law in San Francisco, Lori Levinson of Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, and Susanna Sherry of the Vanderbilt University Law School. We'll also hear from Michelle Harner from the University of Maryland School of Law about two bankruptcy decisions and John Thomas of the Georgetown University Law Center regarding patent law cases. Beth Wiggins of our research division and Jim Chance from our education division will moderate the program. In the first part of the program, we'll examine cases involving the First and Fourteenth Amendments, federal courts and civil procedure, federalism, separation of powers, federal statutes, reproductive rights, religious freedom, and bankruptcy. After a short break, we'll look at patent law, criminal law, and procedure, and the Sixth Amendment. The written materials that accompany this program at FJC Online include an outline with a summary of each of the decisions that we will discuss, along with an appendix with summaries of the remaining cases decided by the court this term. The online outline also contains links to the full opinions. We begin with a look at an important First Amendment decision. Heffernan v. City of Patterson asks whether a person can sue to recover from the violation of a constitutional right even when he didn't exercise that right. Heffernan worked for Patterson Police Chief James Wittick, who'd been appointed by Mayor Jose Torres. Torres was running for re-election against Ga James Spignola. Heffernan's mother asked him to pick up a lawn sign for her at Spignola's headquarters. Well, it got back to Police Chief Wittick that Heffernan had been seen holding the lawn sign and talking to Spignola's campaign staff. And then Hefferman was demoted for what his supervisors perceived as his active involvement in Spignola's campaign. That just wasn't true. Heffernan was only there to do his mother a favor. Heffernan sued, saying the demotion violated his First Amendment rights. But both the Federal District Court and the Court of Appeals rejected his argument because Hefferman was not actually engaged in First Amendment activity. The Court of Appeals said that a free speech retaliation claim was only actionable when the adverse action was in response to an employee's actual, not perceived exercise of constitutional rights. So, Lori, what did the Supreme Court say? Well, the Supreme Court ruled 6-2 to two in Heffernan's favor. The majority said that even though prior case law did not resolve this issue, the government had acted pursuant to a constitutionally harmful policy whether or not Heffernan was involved in the political activity. And also, Heffernan was directly harmed by this policy. The real harm here, the court said, was in discouraging employees from engaging in protected activities. I think that the case is most important in holding that motive matters in free speech analysis. The Supreme Court's been inconsistent about that in the past. President was famously in United States versus O'Brien in 1969. The court upheld a federal statute that made it a federal crime for men to burn or destroy their draft cards. 
the law is clearly motivated by a desire to punish that form of expression. But the Supreme Court upheld the statute saying the motive of the government doesn't matter. Heffernan clearly establishes that the government violates the First Amendment if its motive is to punish speech. Thank you. Our discussion of 14th Amendment cases are next. Our discussion of 14th Amendment cases begins with what is surely one of the most widely anticipated decisions of the term Fisher versus University of Texas. We might more properly call this uh, decision Fisher II because the case was already before the court in 2013. But to understand this decision, we need to go back even further. In 2003, the court held in Grutter versus Bollinger that colleges and universities have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body and may use race as one consideration among many in admissions decisions. Texas state law granted admission to the university to every student who graduated in the top 10% of their high school class anywhere in the state. That would fill about 75% of the available freshman slots, but it still wouldn't provide as diverse a student body as the university felt it needed. So in 2004, the regents at University of Texas initiated a new admissions policy aimed at developing a more diverse and uh, undergraduate population, or that meant the remaining 25% of the class would be admitted based on an individualized review of applications, essays, high school grades, test scores, uh, seven other factors were considered. One of these was that the student's presence on campus would, con would contribute to racial diversity. Now, Abigail Fisher, a white woman who had been denied admission to the university in 2008, brought suit claiming that the use of race in admissions violated her fourth, 14th Amendment rights under the Equal Protection Clause. The district court ruled in her favor, rule, I'm sorry, ruled in favor of the university, and the Fifth Circuit affirmed but the Supreme Court reversed and remanded. It held that a college or university must prove that there, there is no race-neutral way to accomplish diversity before it can use race as a factor. The court imposed its highest standard of review, strict scrutiny, and, and remanded the case to the Fifth Circuit for rehearing based on their decision. The Fifth Circuit ruled that Texas had met the strict scrutiny burden and, the, and Fisher appealed to the uh, Supreme Court. So, at that time, how did the justices handle this, Susanna? Well, surprising most people, they ruled five, four to three, that the university had met its burden of showing that they had a compelling interest in more diversity and that there was no race-neutral way to accomplish that goal and, therefore, that uh, Abigail Fisher's equal protection rights weren't violated. Now, it was four to three because Justice Kagan had recused herself because she dealt with the case earlier when she was Solicitor General. What made it surprising was that the decision was written by Justice Kennedy, who had never before voted to uphold an affirmative action program. So he relied on several things to conclude that this affirmative action program was constitutional. Uh, first, the university had studied the problem for months and then had adopted the program in good faith, and that's something we'll return to in a minute. Uh, the court also said that there was evidence that minority students on campus experienced feelings of isolation and lone loneliness because of the low numbers, uh, and that the percentage of minority students had stagnated under the top 10 percent plan alone. And then finally, the court pointed out that there were many undergraduate classes that had few or no minorities in the class. Justice Kennedy's majority opinion stressed that college universities have a compelling interest in having a critical mass of diverse students, but he said college universities don't need to quantify what's necessary for a critical mass. He also said the fact that a college university has one mechanism to achieve diversity, like a top 10 percent plan, doesn't keep them from having other mechanisms to attain diversity. I think the most important part of Justice Kennedy's opinion is at the end we talked about the need for deference to college universities in making academic judgments with regard to diversity. He talked about how states can be laboratories for experimentation. This was so different in tone from his opinion three years ago, where he said there's been no deference to college universities in deciding whether or not affirmative action was necessary to achieve diversity. 
But I do think it's important to emphasize that he said that a college or university has to prove a compelling need for it to have diversity. It has to prove that there's no other way to achieve diversity. It has to go through periodic reexamination to show that the program continues to be necessary and is nearly tailored. Now, there were some pretty vigorous dissents in this case, weren't there? Yes, there were two. Justice Thomas uh, again declared his view that any use of race in college admissions violates the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, but he also joined the Chief Justice in a dissent written by Justice Alito that, by the way, ran 50 pages, mm -hmm. more than twice what the majority opinion was. Uh, and Justice Alito's opinion uh, questioned quite a few of the majority's uh, arguments and assertions, for example, about how it was that the university came to use race in its admissions prop, uh, process, about the role that race did play in the admissions process, uh, and about the relative balance of uh, various minority groups that were represented uh, in the undergraduate classes. But the bottom line is that this decision is a huge victory for colleges and universities that want to engage in affirmative action. I agree. It is a very big victory for those schools. I think the bottom line is that there's essentially no affirmative action policy short of racial quotas that will be held unconstitutional. And I think this decision tells schools that the more opaque they make their admissions program, uh, the, the uh, more likely they are to withstand constitutional scrutiny. I disagree with you here. I don't think the message is that affirmative action programs we've held so long as they're not racial quotas. Justice Kennedy is very careful to say that a college university must prove its need for a diversity in body, and it must prove there's no other way to achieve diversity except affirmative action. He pointed out Texas had gone through a year-long study and published a report documenting this. He also emphasizes that the need for college universities to go through periodic reexamination to continually reestablish the need for their affirmative action programs. That is indeed what the majority says, but as the dissents point out, the court doesn't examine the university's claims very closely. It's a more deferential review than he says it is. And so I think ultimately the lower courts are going to be faced with a choice between following what the Supreme Court says and following what the Supreme Court has done. Thanks. Our next two decisions are also about the Equal Protection Clause, but this time as it applies to redistricting plans. In the early 1960s, the court announced the principle of one person, one vote, meaning that all legislative districts, both state and federal, had to be about the same size and pop uh, population. But what the court has been less clear about over the years is whether that calculation should measure total numbers of persons or total numbers of voters in the prospective district. The challengers in our next decision, Evanwell versus Abbott, argued that Texas state legislative districts should be based on the number of eligible voters, not total population. They contend that every voter should have equal representation in the political process. Right now, Texas uses the, or the Texas uses the total population in its calculation. Now, this was an eight to zero decision. Erwin, will you tell us about it? Justice Ginsburg wrote the opinion for the court the court held that it is constitutionally permissible to district on the basis of total population. She looked at constitutional history. She focused on our Article I of the Constitution and Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, both say that the House of Representatives will be districted based on population. She focused on precedent, how prior Supreme Court decisions had always assumed that district based on total population. She focused on practice, how in all 50 states districts done based on total population. Uh, so, as Irwin said, the court rejected the challenger's assertion that it had to be based on voter population. Um, but the solicitor general had argued uh, that it should, that the court should hold that states were required to use total population rather than vo voter population. And on that question, the court split. The majority ruled that total population was a proper method, but then said it was uh, not going to decide whether it was the only proper method, although some of the reasoning in the case suggests that maybe it is the only proper method. Justice Thomas concurred in the judgment only because he wanted to make the choice totally up to the states as between voter population and total population. And Justice Alito concurred in the judgment only in, in order to criticize the majority's reliance on allocation of congressional seats, which he did not think was appropriate, and also to, to stress that the court had not and should not decide question the question of whether the states could use 
different populations in their calculations. So I think that question is going to come back to the court uh, as soon as some state decides to use voter population instead of total population. I agree with you on that. I think it's interesting the court did not address whether it be constitutional to district on the basis of number of eligible voters. There's a prior Supreme Court case, Burns versus Richardson in 1966, that approved districting on the basis of eligible voters. Even though this case did not change the law, I think it's enormously important from a practical and a political perspective. It's particularly significant with regard to the voting strength of minority communities. There might be a number of non-citizens, both documented and undocumented. Had the court held otherwise, there would be redistricting in cities and states across the country. Maybe what's most important is at the end of Justice Ginsburg's opinion, where she stresses that elected officials represent all constituents, citizen and non-citizen, adult and children. Our second one-person, one-vote equal protection decision is Harris versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. This one is more straightforward. Last term, the Supreme Court upheld an Arizona constitutional provision giving redistricting decisions to an independent commission made up of two Democrats, two Republicans, and an independent. That commission adopted a redistricting plan by a vote of three to two, with the two Republicans dissenting. A group of voters sued challenging the plan, and a three-judge federal district court upheld it. The challenger's argument was that because there was a 4.07 deviation between the populations of the largest and smallest districts and, uh, that the plan violated the one-person, one-vote principle and their equal protection rights under the 14th Amendment. Justice Breyer wrote for a unanimous court that the redistricting plan was constitutional. He wrote that the Constitution does not demand mathematical perfection and that generally de deviations of less than 10 percent are upheld. The court rejected the argument that the redistricting was done to help Democratic candidates and said that the deviations predominantly reflected that the commission attempted to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. Justice Breyer also wrote that even though the Supreme Court had effectively invalidated the pre-compliance requirement of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, that it was still in effect in 2000, or 2010 uh, when the commission took its actions. Susanna, any thoughts on this decision? I'd only point out that the court didn't decide whether partisanship was an illegitimate factor in redistricting decisions. It just held that partisanship didn't play a substantial role in this redistricting decision. It's a really good point. I also think it's important to emphasize that Justice Breyer said for deviations that are less than 10 percent, the burden is on the challenger to prove an impermissible motive. In our final 14th Amendment decision, we shift our focus from the Equal Protection to the Due Process Clause. This is Williams versus Pennsylvania. Terrence Williams was convicted of murder in 1984 and sentenced to death. For the prosecutor in that case to seek the death penalty, she needed to get permission from the district attorney, who was then Ronald Castile. Thirty years later, with Williams still on death row, it came to light that the prosecution had withheld possible exculpatory information in violation of Brady v. Maryland during Williams' first trial. Williams filed a, a state habeas petition, and his execution was delayed, or was stayed, and a sentencing hearing, new one, was scheduled. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania asked its own S Supreme Court to vacate the stay, which it did, and that's how this case got to the Supreme Court. Can you tell us why, Susanna? Because by then, Ronald Castile, who had been the district attorney when the state had decided to seek the death, penal death penalty, was the chief justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Williams asked Castile to recuse himself from the decision, or at the very least to refer the recusal motion to the full court. Castile did neither. He participated in the decision in which the state Supreme Court unanimously reversed the trial court's grant of the writ of habeas corpus. And so the question before the U.S. U.S. Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court was whether Chief Justice Castile's participation in the decision violated Williams' due process rights. And the Supreme Court ruled five to three that it did violate due process for Castile to participate. Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court. Justice Kennedy stressed that the core of due process is a requirement for an impartial decision maker. The court said for Castile to participate, I mean, involved in the case as district attorney had too great a risk of actual bias. 
And the question of involvement, the majority said, was, was whether uh, he played a direct role or uh, made a critical decision. And what counts as playing a direct role or making a critical decision, the court said, is a very fact-bound determination. But the decision to seek the death penalty is that kind of a decision for every responsible prosecutor. And in addition, as the court pointed out, Castile, when he ran for judicial office, had run a campaign based in part on how many people he had sentenced, he had sent to death row. So clearly for him, it was a significant, not a casual decision. Justice Kennedy's opinion stresses that it's an objective test as whether due process is violated by having somebody participate in the decision or involved in the case in another way. And here he focused on there was just too great a risk of actual bias to comply with due process. We should also point out that the majority said that an unconstitutional failure to recuse is a structural error that is not amenable to harmless error analysis. So regardless of whether the particular judge's decision was dispositive, it is still error. So the court remanded to the state court for a new review uh, of the state's appeal. And we should also note that, that Chief Justice Castile actually resigned from the court two weeks after the decision. Mm. Erwin, uh, Susanna, thank you. I understand we have a question. We do. Um, and the question is, is how does Williams relate to the court's earlier decision in Caperton versus Massey Cole about due process and the disqualification of judges? In both cases, the Supreme Court found a violation of due process. Both opinions were written by Justice Kennedy. Both stressed that it's an objective test in due process, and both focused on whether there's too great a risk of actual bias. All right, next, some federal court and civil procedure decisions. The court issued a number of decisions this term that spoke to the powers of the lower federal courts in trying cases and hearing appeals. The first two we're gonna look at involved class actions. First, in Campbell, versus e, uh, Campbell Ewald versus Gomez, the original plaintiff, Jose Gomez, sued the Campbell Ewald company for violating the Telephone Consumer Protection Act by sending him a text message that he had never consented to receive. Gomez filed a class action complaint on behalf of a nationwide class of people who had also not consented to receive the text. Gomez sought treble statutory damages as well as an injunction against Campbell's sending unsolicited messages. Now, what did Campbell Ewald do, Evan? Well, before uh, the deadline for Gomez to file a motion for class certification had passed, uh, Campbell Ewald offered to satisfy his uh, personal treble damages claim. It also proposed uh, an injunction that would have barred it from uh, sending text messages in violation of the TPCA. Uh, but Campbell Ewald denied liability and denied the allegations uh, that were made in the complaint. Gomez turned down the offer. So what was the issue before the Supreme Court? Uh, there were two issues before the Supreme Court, and we'll get to the second one uh, in a minute. In terms of the class action question, Campbell Ewald argued that there was no federal jurisdiction to uh, certify the class because it had offered to satisfy all of Gomez's uh, demands for relief, thus mooting the case, um, the named plaintiff's case. So what did the court do, Susanna? Well, Justice Ginsburg wrote for the court, and it held that under Rule 68 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, an unaccepted settlement offer has no force. In other words, it cannot moot the case. And she likened it to an unaccepted contract offer in that it creates no lasting rights or obligations of any kind. Wasn't this an issue that was before the Supreme Court just a few years ago? It was, in a case called Genesis Healthcare versus Simchik. But in that case, unlike this one, this one, Simchik had agreed that her case was moot. And the only question was what that did to the class action. In this case, of course, Gomez did not agree that his was moot. Um, in Simchik, though, Justice Kagan wrote a dissent that the court essentially adopted in this case. Uh, Kagan wrote that, Justice Kagan wrote that an unaccepted settlement offer was a legal nullity with no operative effect. And in Campbell Ewald, that's what Justice Ginsburg adopted. Okay, but there were a couple of dissents in this case and another issue that you mentioned, Evan. Right. 
First, the court reserved the question of whether uh, the case would be moot if the defendant had not only made the offer, but had actually deposited the full amount of uh, the plaintiff's individual claim in an account payable to the plaintiff, uh, and if the court had entered judgment for the plaintiff in that amount. The dissents made a lot out of that reservation in the majority opinion. Uh, the Chief Justice, along with Justices Scalia and Alito, uh, opined that the question isn't whether an unaccepted offer creates a contract, but instead whether there remains a case or controversy uh, between the two parties when one party offers to fully meet the other party's demands. I don't think we've seen the last of these questions. For example, the Ninth Circuit has already held that depositing the full amount into an escrow account for the plaintiff is not enough to moot, at least not before the plaintiff has a, an opportunity for a, a full hearing on the class certification motion. And what about the second issue that you mentioned, Evan? Um, Campbell Ewald had also argued that because it's client at the time was the United States, uh, at the time that it had sent out those original texts, was the United States Navy, uh, that Campbell Ewald couldn't be sued because it shared in the government's uh, sovereign immunity. The majority rejected that argument, uh, holding that the company's status as a government contractor did not entitle it to derivative sovereign immunity. Federal contractors can invoke uh, immunity from suit for their federal work, but not when they violate federal law or violate the government's explicit instructions. <laughs> Thanks. Our second class action decision is Tyson's Food versus Buifakeo. The class in this case was made up of workers at a Tyson's pork processing plant who had, uh, they had to spend time before and after work donning and doffing protective clothing. The workers filed a complaint under the Fair Labor Standards Act, or FLSA, that they were not receiving statutorily mandated overtime pay for time spent doing these activities. Tyson called the donning and doffing time K-code time, and in 1998, it started paying workers for four minutes of K-code time, the estimated time that it took workers to put on and take off the protective clothing. In 2007, it stopped paying all workers a uniform K-code time and instead paid some workers between four and eight minutes and other workers nothing. Well, Tyson's kept no records of the time that each employee actually spent donning and doffing, and the workers filed suit under the FLSA and a similar Iowa state law. The suit asked that the Iowa state claims be certified as a class under Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And because Tyson kept no records of actual time spent donning and doffing, the workers had to rely on an expert study using representative samples of this donning and doffing time. And that was the source of the major issue before the Supreme Court. Wasn't it, Susanna? That's exactly right. One of the experts had videotaped over 700 employees in different departments donning and doffing the protective gear and came up with an average amount of time for each of the departments. Then a second expert used that at those averages plus the workers' actual time records of, of their non-K time work uh, and figured out uh, how much time each employee had worked, including the donning and doffing, to determine whether they'd worked overtime. Uh, but Tyson argued that no class should be certified because the different workers in different departments took different times to don and doff, and that the experts' statistical evidence could not make up for those differences, and therefore, Tyson said, individual issues would predominate over the common issues that were needed for class certification. And what did the court decide? The majority rejected Tyson's argument. It uh, rejected a categorical prohibition on representative evidence in class actions and held that the propriety of uh, such evidence depended on the, uh, I'm quoting here, the degree to which the evidence is reliable in proving or disproving the elements of the cause of action. The court uh, said that representative evidence was particularly appropriate in this case uh, because Tyson had failed to keep uh, any records of the time that employees spent donning and doffing the protective gear. 
Uh, and the majority distinguished uh, between this case and its earlier decision in uh, Walmart versus Dukes, where it had ruled that uh, workers couldn't use representative evidence uh, to certify a class. In this case, unlike in Walmart, um, the representative evidence was sufficiently probative for um, individual employees to use that representative evidence to support their individual claims. I think the class action plaintiffs are going to rely on this decision in the future to try and introduce statistical or representative evidence, but I think we should keep in mind two caveats. Um, first, Justice Kennedy wrote that the use of representative evidence to establish class-wide liability is neither always banned nor always permitted. It depends on, and here I'm quoting, the purpose for which the sample is being introduced and on the underlying cause of action. The key, I think, will be to establish whether the particular representative or sample evidence could be used to establish liability in individual cases, in which case it can be used in the class action. Um, and the other caveat is that the court didn't decide whether a class can be certified if it contains members who are uninjured and therefore have no right to relief. Yeah, the majority refused to reach that question because the district judge hadn't yet apportioned uh, the damages for purposes of distribution. Uh, in their dissent, uh, Justices Thomas and Alito wrote that they would have held that uninjured class members may never uh, recover. Chief Justice Roberts wrote a concurring opinion that could be important on that. He said it's an unresolved question whether a class can be certified if it has members who didn't suffer the injury and who don't have money damages. That's an issue that's now splitting the lower courts. Thank you. Our third decision, Americold Realty Trust versus ConAgra Foods, asked how to determine the citizenship of a trust for purposes of diversity jurisdiction. Americold was a real estate investment trust, or REIT, that owned a warehouse that burned down. ConAgra lost food in the fire and sued Americold in federal court under diversity jurisdiction. Americold argued that diversity was incomplete because the citizenship of a REIT was based on the residences of all its shareholders. ConAgra argued that Americold's citizenship should be based on the residences of its trustees only. The court agreed with Americold. The controlling principle is the difference between corporations and unincorporated entities. A corporation is considered a citizen of the state where it is incorporated and where it has a principal place of business. Unincorporated entities like an REIT are considered citizens of the states of all its members. Now, Shapiro versus McManus. 28 U.S.C. Section 2284B1 provides that upon the filing of a request for three judges, the judge to whom the request is presented shall, unless he determines that three judges are not required, immediately notify the chief judge of the circuit who shall designate the three judges. Now the question before the court in Shapiro concerns the interpretation of the phrase, unless he determines that three judges are not required. How did this one come before the court, Susanna? Well, it started when a bipartisan group of Maryland citizens objected to the results of their state's 2011 redistricting. Um, they said it was gerrymandering. And they brought a pro se action in federal court alleging that the redistricting burdened their First Amendment rights of association. Uh, and they asked for a three-judge court to hear, to hear the complaint. But the district judge, instead of notifying the uh, chief judge of the circuit, instead the district judge dismissed the case on the ground that it didn't state a claim uh, for relief uh, under Twombly and Iqbal. And what did the court do, Evan? The court held that the language in the statute was mandatory, uh, that the original judge, therefore, was required to notify the chief circuit judge and, and didn't have any discretion to dismiss the case. Justice uh, Scalia wrote for a unanimous court here and said that the phrase, unless he determines that three judges are not required, did not mean uh, that the judge had discretion to dismiss the action on its merits. Instead, the court said that the judge must read the complaint simply to determine that it presents the kind of case that's covered by the three-judge statute. And here the question uh, was the constitutionality of apportionment, which clearly was within the scope of the statute. 
I think that main part of the holding is going to be of somewhat limited precedential value because it's only going to apply to cases that require a, a three-judge court. But there may be one part of the case that's of broader relevance. The court rejected a separate argument by the defendants. They had argued that the claim raised what's called an insubstantial federal question, and that therefore there was no federal there was no federal jurisdiction, uh, and therefore the dismissal was proper. And the court said no. The court reiterated that there's a big difference between a failure to state a claim for relief under Twombly and Iqbal on the one hand, and failing to raise a substantial federal question at all on the other. The court wrote that the case lacks a substantial federal question only if the federal claims are, and I quote, wholly insubstantial and frivolous. But under Twombly and Iqbal, the case can be dismissed if the factual allegations don't plausibly establish an entitlement to relief. Possibly frivolous lawsuits were also at the heart of our next decision, Bruce versus Samuels. Under the Pr Prison Litigation Reform Act, prisoners filing cases in federal court must pay filing fees, even if they qualify for informa pauperis status. The purpose of the law is to keep prisoners from filing frivolous lawsuits and clogging up the courts. The prisoner who brings a case must pay an initial fee, which varies depending on how much money he or she has in their prison account. Then the prisoner can pay the balance of the fee in monthly installments limited to 20% of the prisoner's preceding month's income. More than a few prisoners bring multiple cases in federal court, and the question before the Supreme Court in this case was whether the 20% installment payments should be calculated per case or per prisoner. The court decided that the fees were to be assessed per case, not per, pris per prisoner. The court wrote that since all the parties agree that the initial fee should be assessed on a per case basis, the remaining installment should also be assessed that way. Also, the PLRA's goal of discouraging frivolous prisoner lawsuits would be undermined. And finally, Dietz versus Bolden. The court addressed the question of whether a judge can rescind a jury discharge order and recall the jury in a civil trial if the judge discovers that the verdict contains legal error. In this case, a jury returned a legally impermissible verdict, but the judge didn't realize the error until shortly after he had excused the jury. So he brought the jury back again and ordered them to deliberate again to correct the mistake. The question before the Supreme Court was whether a judge could recall a jury that had been discharged or whether the court can remedy the error by just ordering a new trial. So, Susanna, how did the court answer that question? The court said that the judge that the, the judge could recall a dismissed jury, but only within certain limitations. Uh, judges have inherent power to achieve the efficient disposition of cases, but they can only do so uh, in a way that's reasonable and that's not contrary to any rule or statute. So, the recall order is within the judge's power, but it has to be carefully circumscribed to make sure that the uh, parties have an impartial jury. Yeah, and in order to make sure that no juror has been tainted uh, between the time of dismissal and the time of recall, then the court said that the judge has to consider a number of factors. One is the length of time between the dismissal and the recall. A second would be uh, whether jurors had spoken to anybody about the case. Uh, after being dismissed and before being recalled. A third is the public reaction to the verdict. Was it emotional or was it subdued? Uh, a fourth uh, factor is whether any jurors accessed on, uh, any online resources uh, related to the case between dismissal and recall. And the court said that the judges should consider any other factors that it finds to be relevant as well. I think we should point out that the court also recognized this inherent power only in civil cases. It did not address the question of whether there was such a power in criminal cases. Yeah, you know, I think that there's going to be questions uh, in the future uh, regarding the implementation of this. For example, I mean, what if a juror uh, spoke to somebody on their cell phone uh, immediately after the verdict came in, uh, but all they said was, we're finished, I'm coming home. Um, I wouldn't think that that would preclude a jury recall, but I think we're going to have to see. Thanks, Evan. Susanna. Next up, federalism and separation of powers.
Standing to sue, the right to bring an action in federal court has three prongs. The plaintiff must have suffered an injury in fact, that injury must be traceable to the defendant, and the in injury must be likely to be addressed by the requested relief. In Spokio versus Robbins, the question is what constitutes injury in fact? Spokio is a website that provides in-depth reports containing a great deal of personal information about people. In the case of Thomas Robbins, most of that information was wrong. Spokio's profile of Robbins said he had a graduate degree, was employed in a technical or professional field, and was married with children. None of that was true. Robbins sued Spokio for violation of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which allows victims of so-called willful violations to recover statutory damages of between $100 and $1,000. A federal district court dismissed Robbins' suit for lack of standing in not pleading a sufficient injury in fact. But the Ninth Circuit reversed that decision and allowed the case to go forward. Irwin, what did the Supreme Court do? The Supreme Court, in a 6-2 decision, reversed the Ninth Circuit and remanded the case for further consideration. Justice Alito wrote the opinion for the court. He said, in order to meet the injury requirement of Article III, the injury has to be both particularized and concrete. He found that Robbins met the requirement for a particularized injury because he had personally suffered the harm. But the court held that the Ninth Circuit had failed to consider whether he actually met the requirement of a concrete injury. A concrete injury, the court said, is an injury that's de facto. It actually exists. It has to be real. It can't be abstract. And the court said it's different. Concreteness is different from particularization. But the court also says that it's not necessarily synonymous with, in with tangible. There can be intangible but concrete uh, injuries. So the question was, uh, Spokio failure to follow proper procedures in obtaining the information might or might not have caused a real or concrete harm. Uh, and, and so the court remanded to the Ninth Circuit for a determination of whether the alleged harms were, in fact, sufficiently concrete. I think this is a decision that's going to create a great deal of confusion in the lower courts. This is the first time the Supreme Court has ever said that particularized and concrete are distinct requirements, each which must be met. But the court, as Susanna just said, didn't offer a clear definition of what it means for an injury to be concrete. I do think it's important that the Supreme Court reaffirmed that Congress, by statute rights, even rights that would otherwise exist, and the infringement of those rights are an injury sufficient for standing. American nationals can sue state sponsors of terrorism in the U.S. courts, but even if they win, they often face practical and legal difficulties enforcing their judgments. In other words, they can win money damages for their injuries, but they often have a hard time getting paid. So to help more than a hundred, or I'm sorry, more than a thousand plaintiffs who sued Iran and prevailed, Congress enacted the Iran Threat Reduction and Syria Human Rights Act of 2012. The law makes a designated set of assets that are frozen in U.S. banks available to satisfy judgments in that specific case, identified by name and docket number in the law. These assets and this law were the focus of our final decision, Bank Markazi versus Peterson. Bank Markazi is the central bank of Iran. It argued that the law violated separation of powers because it usurped the role of the courts by directing a particular result in the pending enforcement proceeding. So what was the actual question before the court? The issue here is whether this statute is a prospective change in the law, in which case it's constitutional, or that it's Congress directing the federal courts how to decide a specific case, in which case it's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court, in a 6 to the decision, with the majority opinion by Justice Ginsburg, upheld the constitutionality of the statute. That's right. And Justice Ginsburg wrote that uh, this, that although the Constitution bars Congress from telling courts how to apply pre-existing law to specific cases, Congress can amend that law and then make it retroactive. And that's exactly what this statute did. Uh, it uh, directed the court to apply a new standard to a pending case. And she went on to say that the statute is not unconstitutional, even though the new legal standard applied to virtually undisputed facts, and it wasn't unconstitutional, even though it prescribed a rule for an identified specific case. 
But the dissent saw this as Congress directing the federal courts is how to decide a specific case, and that violates the Constitution. I actually think the dissent was right in this case. The, I, I think the statute is equivalent to a law that says in a lawsuit between A and B, B wins. What this decision means is that litigants, disappointed litigants, can now petition Congress to change the results in their cases uh, as long as they do so during the pendency of their appeals. We disagree on this one. I think Congress always can change the law, and the new law will apply to all future cases. That's what happened here. Thanks. And now, how the court <clears throat> viewed some federal statutes. Two decisions now interpreting federal statutes, both involving the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC. In CSRT Van Expedited versus EEOC, the question was when can a defendant recover attorney's fees as a prevailing party under Title VII? The EEOC had filed a class action suit against C. SRT, charging sexual harassment on behalf of more than 250 female employees at the company. The district court dismissed all but two of the claims on a variety of procedural grounds, including the EEOC's failure to properly investigate all the claims. The district court then awarded CSRT $4 million in attorney's fees as the prevailing party. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed that judgment holding that a defendant can only be considered a prevailing party by obtaining a ruling on the merits. So, Irwin, how did the justices come down on this question? The Supreme Court unanimously reversed the Eighth Circuit, just as Kennedy wrote for the court. He noted the court previously had held that a defendant can receive attorney's fees in a Title VII case. The standard is that the defendant can get attorney's fees if the plaintiff's claim is frivolous, unreasonable, or groundless, or the plaintiff continues to pursue the litigation after it's shown that the claim is frivolous, unreasonable, or groundless. Justice Kennedy said there's many ways that a defendant can win in a lawsuit. It doesn't take a judgment on the merits. Here, where all of the claims had been dismissed against the defendant, it was obviously the defendant prevailing. I think it ought to be noted uh, that the court here didn't address the question of whether there had to be a preclusive judgment in order for the defendant to prevail. The court said that that issue had not been properly raised below, but I do think we can expect it to come up again in future litigation. How important do you think this case will be to those future cases? I don't this, think this case changes the legal standard, but it is an important victory for defendants. It clearly holds defendants can be awarded attorney's fees under Title VII or similar statutes, even without a judgment on the merits. Okay. Our next decision, Green versus Brennan, asked the court to decide when the statute of limitations begins to run in constructive discharge cases under Title VII. Marvin Green was a 35-year-old black postal service employee who brought a claim of racial discrimination when he was passed over for promotion to postmaster in Boulder, Colorado. Not long after he brought that claim, his supervisors accused him of intentionally delaying the mails, which is a federal offense. Even though the inspector general terminated its investigation of the matter for insufficient evidence, Green's supervisors continued to threaten to prosecute him criminally. Finally, Green signed a settlement in which his supervisors agreed to drop their efforts to prosecute him, and he agreed either to take a demotion or resign, and he eventually resigned. Evan, where does the story go from here? Well, 41 days after resigning, uh, but 96 days after uh, signing the settlement agreement, Green contacted an EEO counselor to report an unlawful constructive discharge. He eventually brought suit in the federal district court, which was dismissed on the grounds uh, that it was untimely. The court said that under the statute, the EEOC had to be uh, contacted within 45 days, quote, of the matter alleged to be uh, discriminatory, end quote. And on the merits, the Supreme Court ruled seven to one that in a Title VII constructive discharge case, the statute of limitations does not begin to run until the employee resigns. And I think also very importantly, that resignation occurs for purposes of this statute 
uh, when the employee gives a formal notice of resignation? Justice Sotomayor wrote the opinion for the court, and she says that actually quitting is an element of the cause of action for constructive discharge. She said nothing in Title VII was meant to change that. She said having the statute of limitations calc in this way furthers the remedial scheme of Title VII. I think it's an important victory for plaintiffs in terms of giving a statute of limitations that's most favorable to them. I agree. I, I think this case creates a bright line where there previously did not exist one. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Erwin. Our next panel will be Reproductive Rights and Religious Freedom. Whole Woman's Health versus Hallerstedt was arguably the most sweeping abortion rights decision by the court since 1992's Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey. Whole Woman's Health was a challenge to a Texas statute that imposed several new requirements on abortion clinics in the name of protecting women's health and safety. Among other things, the law required the clinics to meet the same standards required for ambulatory surgical centers and required doctors performing abortions at the clinics to have admitting privileges at a hospital located no more than 30 miles from the clinic. What did the court decide about the statute and what was its reasoning, Lori? Well, Beth, the court decided in a five to three decision that the Texas law was unconstitutional because it put an undue burden on a woman's right to have an abortion. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing about the court's ruling is that it identified and detailed the court's rule in determining whether this is an undue burden on a woman's right. Justice Breyer went point by point through the district court record, showing why he believed that these restrictions did not help and serve women's needs. He pointed out how the risks of an abortion are much lower than the risks of common medical procedures that can be done in a doctor's office or even in a home. He even pointed out that at oral argument, Texas could not identify one woman who actually benefited from the requirements imposed by this law. And by contrast, he pointed out that the cost of this new requirement had led to the closure of dozens of abortion clinics in Texas, making it more difficult for women to get safe legal abortions. This case definitely clarified uh, the undue burden standard laid down by the court and clarified that what it requires is a court must balance the burdens that a law uh, imposes on abortion access against the benefit that the law provides for women's health. And importantly, as Lord he said the courts shouldn't defer to legislatures on these questions, but instead should look at the evidence that's presented to the court. And in addition to being an important clarification of the undue burden standard and of the court's own responsibilities, uh, it also, I think, sends a message that there are five justices on the current court who believe that while states do have a legitimate interest in seeing that abortions are permitted, sa are, are done safely, states can't impose restrictions that are pretextual and that imp uh, impose a substantial obstacle in the way of women's access to abortion. Uh, there are several states uh, with similar laws, and challenges have been pending, waiting this decision. And I think in most of those, we'll now need a detailed finding of facts uh, that examine the benefits and the burdens. Justice Ginsburg wrote a short concurring opinion in which she expressed the view that these many recently adopted state laws, the so-called targeted restriction of abortion provider statutes, are all unconstitutional. Okay. Other than the four to four decisions resulting from Justice Scalia's death that John Cook mentioned earlier, it's hard to know what the effects his passing had on the work of the court this term. But in Zubik versus Burwell, it arguably led to a unanimous per curiam opinion, remanding the cases collectively heard under Zubik for reconsideration. Zubik was a challenge, of course, to the Affordable Care Act's requirement that some religious organizations must submit a form to take advantage of, of an ex exemption from providing contraceptive coverage. The religious organizations protested that even signing the form substantially burdened their religious freedom in violation of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. After oral argument, the court asked for additional briefing on possible ways that the contraceptive coverage could be provided seamlessly without violating the organization's religious freedom while still satisfying the government's interest. In their responses, the parties conceded that might be possible. 
In the decision in Zubik, the court vacated all the judgments below and remanded them to give the parties a chance to find a solution based on the new facts contained in the additional briefing. The court wrote that it was expressing no view on the merits of the cases and, in particular, not deciding whether, whether the organization's religious exercise had been substantially burdened, whether the government has a compelling interest, or whether the current regulations are the least restrictive means of satisfying that interest. That assurance notwithstanding, Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg wrote a concurring opinion to warn lower courts not to construe the per curiam decision as a signal on where the court stands. They noted that the court had issued similar explicit disclaimers before, but that some lower courts had ignored those instructions. So they admonished the courts of appeals on remand not to make that same mistake. Next, we're going to bring you a conversation I had recently with Michelle Harner of the University of Maryland School of Law about some of this term's bankruptcy decisions. After that, we're going to take a five-minute break, and then when we come back, we'll have a conversation Jim had with John Thomas of Georgetown Law Center about two patent decision th decisions this term. But first, here's my conversation with Michelle. Michelle, thanks for being here again this year to talk about the term's bankruptcy cases. We're going to be covering Spokio versus Robbins in another panel. So let's move right into Husky International Electronics versus Ritz. That case, of course, concerned the exceptions to discharge under 523A2 for debts arising out of false pretenses, a false misrepresentation, or actual fraud. So can you tell us a little bit about this case and what the issue was? Absolutely, and thank you for having me again. Uh -huh. So the Husky case deals with a fact pattern that's very familiar to us. Basically, Husky supplied goods to Chrysalis. Chrysalis failed to pay for the goods. Husky ended up with a claim of $164,000. Then Mr. Ritz enters the picture. Mr. Ritz allegedly, through his control and or ownership of Chrysalis, transferred Chrysalis's chrysalises, that's a tongue tire, mm -hmm. uh, to assets to other companies owned and or controlled by Mr. Ritz, leaving chrysalis with no assets to pay Husky's claim. Husky, then not too happy, sues Mr. Ritz using Texas law, among other things, alter ego claims to try to collect the $164,000 from Mr. Ritz. Mr. Ritz then files bankruptcy. This is like, you know, chest here. Mm -hmm. And then Husky says, fine, but our claim is non-dischargeable under Section 523A2A of the Bankruptcy Code because you've committed actual fraud. So what did the court decide about that? And it's, what did they do? I mean, how did they come to their decision? It's interesting because both the majority and the dissent use statutory interpretation tools to get to their respective places. And I think the majority opinion, written by Justice Sotomayor, really takes a straightforward approach looking at the statute's evolution. And the majority says actual fraud was added to the terms false pretenses and false representations in the 1978 code. So actual fraud has to mean something different than those other two terms. And the majority then looks to common law to say, well, of course, we've always interpreted actual fraud to mean fraudulent transfer kinds of schemes like we have here. So for the majority, the bottom line was a very narrow holding, really, in that 523A2A is broader than the Fifth Circuit interpreted it and simply means that actual fraud can be something more than a misrepresentation. So where do we go from here? Do you think the court's going to broaden exceptions to the discharge? It's interesting. You know, and here I would point us to the dissent to think about how far the majority's opinion reaches, because the dissent, authored by Justice Thomas, again, looks at the statutory language but uses more of a contextual approach mm -hmm. in saying that I agree we should think about the common law meaning of terms in a statute, but not if they don't fit in terms of the context of the entire statutory language. And for Justice Thomas, the preamble in Section 523, which speaks to money, property, or services obtained by actual fraud, posed a problem 
to the interpretation given actual fraud by the majority. Justice Thomas says it was nonsensical to think that fraudulent transfer acts could constitute actual fraud for purposes of 523A2A. Interestingly, in footnote 3, the majority recognizes this issue but punts, saying there may be some fraudulent transfers that don't constitute actual fraud within the context of 523A2A, but we think there are some that could. So there are going to be a lot of issues for the Fifth Circuit on remand and lower courts to think about in determining actual fraud under its common law meaning but within the confines of the statutory language of 523A2A. Okay, thank you. Well, at least it gives the lower courts some direction, nowhere to go now between the fifth and the seventh analysis of the case and the issue. Absolutely. Well, we're going to be remiss if we don't talk some about Puerto Rico versus Franklin Trust. Um, as you know, um, that case really left the solution to the insolvency crisis in Puerto Rico in the hands of Congress. Can you tell us a little bit about that case and where we are now? Certainly. So it, it's interesting. You um, mentioned the uh, humanitarian crisis facing the 3.2 million people in Puerto Rico. The decision before the court was really about the economic crisis, although the two, I think, are integrated. And here we have the justices, at least the authoring justices, flipping places. So Justice Thomas authors the majority opinion in Puerto Rico. Justice Sotomayor authors the dissent. And for Justice Thomas, again, a very plain meaning approach to the statute and in thinking about whether Puerto Rico's Recovery Act, which it adopted in 2014, could stand or was it preempted by Section 903 of the Bankruptcy Code. And Justice Thomas says in 1984, Congress amended Section 10152 of the Bankruptcy Code, which defines the term state. And in that amendment, Justice Thomas says Congress removed Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia from only a small sliver of the Bankruptcy Code, right? It's a state for everything but defining who is a debtor for Chapter 9 purposes or for purposes of the gateway provision, as he calls it, in Section 109. C. So given that very narrow approach to the amendment in 1984 to the definition of state, Justice Thomas says Puerto Rico is a, quote, capital S state for all of their purposes under the Bankruptcy Code, including the Chapter 9 preemption language in Section 903. And once you take that approach and say it's a narrow um, extrapolation of Puerto Rico from the de definition of state, it, it's somewhat a problem for Puerto Rico because the Recovery Act is preempted by 903 and that means it's Congress's issue to deal with the economic crisis currently facing uh, Puerto Rico. And that was problematic for the dissent. Ju Justice Sotomayor, I think, was influenced by the crisis facing Puerto Rico and took more of a contextual mm -hmm. approach, saying you have to look at the code as a holistic statutory body and said if we're taking Puerto Rico out of the operative provision of Chapter 9 through the definitional sections, then none of Chapter 9 applies, and she would have allowed the law to stand. Okay. Well, thank you. I think that'll do us for this year, and hope to see you again next year. Thank you so much. Thanks.